I beat you to it. Hey, I got him this time. Darn yes. It. Darn he it. Got, he got me last episode. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Last episode, I was like, oh, yeah. Was that because we had, like, uh, Zach in the middle? I think so. Yeah, yeah, probably. Zach's just going like. Yeah, he's Zach's like, I don't get it. I don't know what it is. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode. It's always fun to have Zach with us as a special guest. Um, welcome back. Hello. Kingdom Story Podcast. Yes. We, uh... Just looking at some notes. Please talk. Oh, yeah, I will. Yeah, Jared's freshening up. So um, two weeks ago, that episode, the first one we posted when we came back, um, I got a message from somebody as a special request to talk about end times eschatology, which is Jared's favorite. So, um, yeah, per that request, we were talking about the exodus and what that means with the resurrection and what that means for... Um, you know, in times stuff, I thought, you know what? Hey, let's do a little uh, series since we're talking about Exodus yeah. and those things. And we'll talk about some of that stuff. But in the interim time, thank you guys so much for joining us. You can like, follow, subscribe and all that fun stuff. Uh, if you're not a patron, you can still sign up. There's plenty of spots. Uh, you can message in. You can tell us exactly like, hey, um, that was a bad subject. Do this subject or not. <laughs> you can help us with some of the, like, what are we going to do with, you know, some of the creative things and, um, but anyways, yeah, yeah. I'm super excited. Welcome back. Hey, Jared, welcome. Jonathan. That's right. Kingdom story. Zach keeps convincing us or keeps trying to convince us to change it to kingdom beards. Yeah. I'm out. Nope, not happening. No. Kingdom Story Podcast. That's Wait, what we have about. some really good looking beards. But I mean, we do. Mine's getting a little. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready mani. for. I'm, I'm ready for some like um, trimming to make it like really clean. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, I mean, whatever. I mean, Kingdom Beards. It's cool, but yep. I'm not. I'm not ready to jump the ship yet. Nope, nope. Kingdom Stories the way it goes, the way it stays, baby. Dude, I appreciate I, Zach for um, you know. I appreciate Sorry, my wife was texting me. Guys, anybody, if your wife texts you, you stop whatever you're doing. I don't care if you're filming or not. You respond to your wife. You do? I still have so much to teach you. You know what? We, <laughs> all right. When, when we were, like, when Jonathan set me up with my wife, this is the <laughs> well, advice he gave okay, me. Okay, hold on a second. To be fair, I didn't set you up with your wife. Right, right. You were already like talking to her That's and pursuing true, true. her. You came I'm, to me with like, Jonathan there's this gave girl I a, really like her, but how do I like... Jonathan's been giving me dating advice since <laughs> I was a single man. Yeah, for sure. And I should say it that way. He's like and the, the seventh person I've helped told me when we were dating. He's like, when a girl texts you, don't immediately respond. Give it. She's going to want you the more and more you leave her... Like in suspense. And I've kept that in my marriage. It's been really great. So like when my wife calls, I give it three hours every time. Okay. To be clear, this is advice for when you're dating. But when you're married, gentlemen, respond to your wife immediately. No, no, no. <laughs> You will make her want you more by just like you have to keep the riz going. When you're married. Like, that's why. I'm going to specifically tell Brooke to watch this episode. <laughs> and be like, you should check in on this one and let She's us know. She's going to get on to my game I, now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell gonna her. I'm going like, to approach her in the sense of like, hey, can you do me a favor? Just check the lighting on that one. and tell, <laughs> <laughs> Just watch the, like, the first couple minutes and tell me what you think of the Sweetie, lighting. I am totally joking. Oh, no. Oh. Don't back down now. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> anyways, we're both recovering from being sick too. So if you hear us randomly cough, apologize. Love you. I've got a golf ball size piece oh, of pressure in all my the time, left dude. Here, man, just like right here, it's it's butthole all, all the right. time. All right, so eschatology. We've been talking about Exodus uh, for two weeks. Yep. Um, we did the first one. Yep. We had Zach on with the second one. Um. It's funny because Zach is like, what do I even do with eschatology? It's yeah, not Exodus. It's not like his fun thing. It's not yours. Where it's like, you right. could, you. Could, I mean, we've talked about it a little bit already with dispensationalism, premillennialism, millennial, yep. like, yep. like who cares a lineal like type stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, we've talked about all these different subjects a little bit, but um, 
per the request that was brought to me, um, what we would like to do, and we're going to, I think we're going to take a couple episodes on this. Yeah. Um, what I would like to do and what was asked is where are we, where do we stand, um, as Pentecostals because as Pentecostals or as vineyard as, okay, let me rephrase that. We came from Pentecostal AG church. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now we're like, we're still Pentecostal, but like we're with the vineyard now. And so I think like when most people that I have conversations about eschatology, Mm -hmm. like if I talk to anybody about it, it feels like the basic thing that comes up that everybody thinks of is they think of, oh, the rapture, Mm -hmm. right? It's like when we think of end times and it's all over, Jesus is going to like split open the sky. He's going to come through on this fiery chariot. He's going to bring this horde of angels in and he's going to be like, oh, my people, I can't whistle. Let's go. And we're just going to start to fly like Superman into the air. We're going to send through the veil, go into the heavens. And then he's going to go, everybody else, you're going to suffer for a while and let the devil run free. Demons and dragons and like everything you can think of, apocalyptic. And then after it's all said and done, he's going to come back and be like, all right, you've suffered enough. I kill you all and send you on to lick a fire. Very nice. No, not really. But um, it feels like <laughs> it feels like that's like what most people's understanding of, at least in the circles I've ran in, sure. growing up in an AG church, like those are the things like when we're in Sunday school and we're growing up, like mm-hmm. in your taught in kids church, like this is what's going to happen in the end. Sure. You know, and I'm sure you'll acknowledge some of the terminology of like, are you pre-trib? Are you post-trib? Tribulation, right. those trials and those things that like we as believers, are we going to suffer in that time and test for our faith? Or are you just going to be all happy glory? We go to paradise for a little while, you know, sure. and hang out and then just wait for it all to be done. And then once everybody's thrown into a lake of fire, New Jerusalem comes on earth, right? Sure. That about sums up what, we, I mean, like, I feel like, <laughs> listen, I'm abbreviating a lot, but like when I have conversations with people, like that's a lot of people's understandings. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, like someone had texted me a picture. I had told them we were going to talk deeper on eschatology and what's the number one thing everybody sends me a picture of Kirk Cameron and left behind, yep. you know, like. What's well, funny, even like media Kurt, and people like this is what they've made you believe is going to happen in the end. Yeah, it's funny. Like Kurt Cameron has like recently come out in the last couple of years and he's like completely changed his view on eschatology. Like um, he's like, no, no, we're not getting like risen up. We're going to win the world. <laughs> like he's a post millennial. Yeah. It's really funny. OK, um, but yeah, no, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to unpack there. So um Let's start with, well, let me kind of give, you You gave a lot there. Yeah. Let me kind yeah. of unpack okay. that Go a little ahead. bit. Because like the reason that we're even doing this is because last week we were talking about um, what is it, what does it look like? What, why do we have um, the Exodus and Revelation kind of looking the same? And I brought in a... Uh, an imagery type of viewpoint of revelation, which is very different than our tradition that we grew up with. Because I presented um, that revelations, uh, revelation chapter six, seven, eight, nine. And then of course, when you're talking about the other bowl and, and, and trumpet judgments, but the seal judgments and all of these things represent the, uh, they represent in figurative form, the 10 plagues of Egypt. Now, um, and I'm using that as figurative imagery language. And so uh, my hope for this small series is to kind of break down in segmented space. Like uh, this episode, we'll talk about tradition. We'll talk about Baptist, Pentecostal, charismatic, and evangelical tradition and why... um, why we've gotten to the eschatology that we're at and why we as vineyard pastors don't agree with it. But I also want to tack on in the next couple things of what does it look like for us to read Revelation? Um, How are there four different views to read Revelation? I also want to talk about um, 
you know, the opposite charismatic Pentecostal tradition that's really, really ramping up right now, which mm-hmm. is called, um, it's uh, the New Apostolic Reformation is really pushing into the seven mountains mandate. Um, and that's a form of um, post-millennialism. So I'm going to really dive into kind of why do we have the eschatology we have? What is, and we'll probably do this in this order, the, the eschatology we have, <coughs> what is the eschatology that's Sorry. become very popular in charismatic circles? Yep. So we'll deal with um, Seven Mountain Mandate in the next episode. And then okay. I'll talk about what are the four ways that we could view Revelation from and what I think is the most appropriate ways we can look at this from uh, a kingdom theology vineyard position. Right. Okay. So, awesome. Fasten your seatbelts because here we go. Okay. So, the first question I want to ask is, and I know we'll probably talk about this in greater lengths, but like, if we're going to start with the background of the AG and what sure. their thought is, because right. we'll start there. You mentioned a few and you want to touch on those. Um, as we're going through each of these, what's, what would be one way that someone should be looking at Revelation on like how to read? Sure. We're going to go in way deeper depth yeah. with that, but like it, we'll take to the, kick it off. The third like how video we in our series, we'll talk okay. about the four ways. So I'll just briefly talk about the four ways and then we'll go real deep into them in the third video. Cool. But there are four different ways that we historically have looked at the book of Revelation. The first one is called historicism in which uh, history itself is playing out the 22 chapters of Revelation. So we can start at a starting point. So we would say 70 AD or whatnot. And we'd say, well, this part in chapter 6 got fulfilled in 300 AD, 600 AD, so on and so forth. And so historicism will try to link historical events with the chapters of Revelation. And this was very, very popular... (coughs) Um, especially in the Reformation movement uh, during the time of John Calvin and Luther. And this was the prominent Protestant position until the 1800s. And it kind of has died out after the Seventh Adventist movement. They're the only ones that really hold it right now. Okay. Um, And then we have a second one, which is called uh, preterism. Preterism is the idea that everything has already happened. So when someone looks at the book of Revelation, uh, they're seeing that everything happened between the time of 65 AD and 70 AD is the most common view because they're trying to say that it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. And so they take the entire book of Revelation and say, um, this book has already been fulfilled. Nothing really needs to be dealt with except Jesus's return. So that's preterism. Then we have idealism. Idealism is the idea that the kingdom story is being presented in images, and it's circular. So it's always retelling the same story over and over and over again. Um, So idealism is the idea that uh, each image is not talking about a specific event, but it's talking about a, uh, it's a concept everything's in conceptual form and it's telling how God is redeeming humanity at the same time he's judging humanity. And then the last one is called (coughs) futurism. So sorry guys. The last one is called futurism. This is the one that we, uh, as default Americans, we most of the time, so Baptist evangelicals, charismatic Pentecostals, we are called futurist because the majority of the time that we look at the text, we think that it's seven years, it's, it's a seven year period in the future. And so futurists will say the book of Revelation is not being fulfilled right now. It hasn't been fulfilled in the past at any point. There's no historical data. It's still all future. And so that's what a futurist is. Um, now, as a vineyard pastor, um, I'm not a futurist. I know some might be a futurist. I don't know why anybody would be a futurist in the vineyard, but (coughs) there might be. Yeah. Um, I'm an idealist. I was going to say, the way you describe it alone, I was like, you're in the idealist camp. Yeah, I'm an idealist. Um, But 
at a future video, I'll talk about the validity and yeah, the non-validity okay. of each. Sure. But yeah, most like uh, if we're talking heritage, Pentecostals, Baptists, Charismatics all come from a stream that you could just call the evangelical stream. If yeah. you're looking at a, if you're looking at a tree and you're looking at like all these branches, so you have the church as the as the as the trunk, mm -hmm. and you have different branches, so you could see like the Roman Catholic or the Eastern Orthodox Protestant branch. We're on that Baptist branch, that low low church branch, and that's where the majority of Baptist evangelicals, Charismatics, and you know where we would find our our family tree. Gotcha. Okay, so thank you for that. So now that you've kind of given an idea of like, okay, looking at revelation in these four different ways and again we'll expand on those in another video um, but now that we're looking at them through these like four lenses potentially as we're going through and we're going to talk about okay well we both came from an ag church you originally came from a baptist church in the mm -hmm. beginning right yep. yeah and then you guys we ended up at the same church together growing up like yep. later which was assemblies um and then like so yeah, like, I mean, let's yeah, talk like, let's talk yeah. about those two like so Typically, like, where do you see, okay, this is, like, where the AG camp kind of lives, and then this is where, like, the Baptist camp kind of sure. lives. Well, <coughs> oh, man, you're having a rough day. I am. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, <coughs> Pentecostals in general, so Pentecostals and Charismatics and Evangelicals all can find their history in the Baptist movement, right? So, the Baptists... Um, They'll claim to go all the way back to the original. Uh, I don't agree with their Baptist history. Um, I see them coming out of the Anabaptist movement in the beginning of the Reformation. But so from about 15, 16th, uh, 15th and 16th century on, we have the Baptist movement most likely. And um, they become very solidified in the, um, in the Americas. Like they are like the bread and butter of that rugged American individualism. Like if you go down to the South, like the Baptist is the most prominent um, <coughs> denomination. The Southern yeah. Baptist denomination <coughs> is the largest non-Catholic denomination in the world. And it's because like, you know, uh, it's, it's grown and it's kind of um, built itself especially in the Americas, and then gone outward. But um, America was ripe for uh, the, the Baptist movement. And um, you, you have this group of uh, Christians called the mainline. So you have Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists. About the time you get to the 19th century, so like late 1800s, you have the seminaries being influenced by the German, uh, a lot of German theologians. And there had been this liberal uh, look at the scriptures at the time. So you have this 19th century, 18th century skepticism that just kind of flowed right into the church. So everything about, is Jesus really historical? Did he die? Did he have a virgin birth? Let's look at all those miracles. Are they valid? Are any of them right? What ended up happening is the Baptist said, we don't want to do anything. We don't want to have anything to do with this kind of stuff. And so what they did is they separated themselves from the seminaries and they became what we call fundamentalists. So the Assemblies of God and the other uh, the other Pentecostal churches, they breed out of that same kind of experience. So much of the converts of Azusa Street, much of the converts that uh, came into the charismatic Pentecostal stream uh, since like, 19, like the 1905 Azusa Street revival that kind of hit the, hit the church, the majority of the beginning um, people were out of the Baptist movement. And so you end up with a smorgasbord of uh, these uh, these fundamentalist Baptists who get filled with the Holy Spirit. And so you see that they just take all of that same theology and they just transplant it right into uh, with their Pentecostal experience. And so that early Pentecostal thing is 
there's very little difference <coughs> between <coughs> fundamentalism and uh, the Assemblies of God, you know, upbringing with with their theology at the at the beginning. And so it, it's just um, so. What ended up happening is when you had the fundamentalist movement, the fundamentalist, the fundamentalist movement uh, had like five specific fundamentals of the faith that they kept to. And then they added on premillennial dispensationalism as their standard. If you were going to be a fundamentalist, you needed to believe in dispensational eschatology. Which meant you believed in a rapture, you believed in a literal seven day, uh, seven year tribulation, and this was the standard. And so you have these newly formed charismatics who are experiencing revival and healing, but at the same time, they somehow had a cognitive dissonance to say, also, the world's gonna get worse and worse and worse, mm -hmm. and we're gonna do this. So you had this kind of warring kind of ideology between revivalism and fatalism which really doesn't make a lot of sense like not at all uh, yeah it doesn't make a lot of sense at yeah all. so like I, I watched this thing um there's this whole podcast that the sacramental charismatic has on this that he's like i don't understand why pentecostals or charismatics would ever be dispensationalist and i agree with him a hundred percent because um you know, you and I grew up in that. Yeah. And it's like, in one sense, we're like, we're always looking for a revival. That's our, like, that's the word we use for everything. Like, right. we want revival. We want the Holy Spirit to come. We want yeah. people to get saved. We want people to get healed. But we have this other thing that we're looking forward to, which is the rapture. And before the rapture, everything's got to get really, really bad, you know? Yeah. So it just, it, at the very onset of the beginning of the tradition of Pentecostalism, you have kind of uh, adopted in um, a theology that kind of runs counter to the rest of the, eth the ethos. <coughs> Dude, I'm so sorry, you guys. I don't know what's happening. Keep going. I might sneak away for a second and get some water, but keep going. Yeah. Um, but so you end up, and like you had mentioned earlier that like <coughs> we are still <coughs> Pentecostals. Yeah. I would say like we're Pentecostals in like the, 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 the small P sense. Like we're not capital P Pentecostals. But that's because we Explain have... the difference. Sure. For sure. For those um, that might not understand. Explain <laughs> the difference. Um, okay. So uh, I won't go into this too heavy. That's okay. We have three different movements in the 20th century. So, like, if you ever hear, like, we're third wave Pentecostals or third wave Charismatics, <coughs> it's because there were three waves. <coughs> Do you need to take a break? <coughs> no. I don't. My gosh. I'm so sorry, everybody. Continue. But there's three waves in the 20th century. So, you have one that Azusa Street is kind of symbolized. That that movement between the early 1900s that starts the assemblies, that starts the Church of God, that starts all the uh, traditional classic Pentecostal churches like that's one move the second move is the charismatic movement in the 19 1960s where the spirit kind of flows into the presbyterians lutherans episcopalians and methodist movement and then you have the 1980s or the 1970s moving into the 80s where it finally comes into the evangelical camp and that's where you have Wimber and Calvary Chapel and the Vineyard all kind of experiencing yeah. the Holy Spirit. So you have three different moves as the Vineyard where third wave, where yep. part of that evangelical move. So we wouldn't be considered Pentecostal in the, in the classic sense. Yep. We would be Pentecostal in the experiential sense. Yep. So where a Pentecostal would believe that... Um, you need to experience speaking in tongues as the initial physical evidence. Like yeah. that's the standard. So what that means is um, in a, if you're not a Pentecostal, let me kind of explain it this way. Um, they believe that you can get saved, but not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Until so until you speak in tongues. Right. So <clears throat> you can get saved, but there's a second thing that needs to happen for you to receive power. And that is that you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit for works of ministry. So you can't have the gifts and the power until you speak in tongues. So that's what they call the second blessing theology. 
And so that was the standard. If you're a classic Pentecostal, like speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence that you're filled with the power. Yeah. If you come down to the I third just think wave, of that's our AG Bible school that we went to right. all, all the way. Right. Had to write papers on that. And it's like, uh, hard to write a paper on something I don't agree with. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you, uh, like the vineyard, the vineyard would take a evangelical approach, meaning that salvation is equated to the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when you yeah. receive Jesus, you also will receive his spirit. Yeah. Um, now there's some caveats to that, depending on what vineyard teacher you're thinking about. So like a lot of us will take an evangelical position and say, when you receive, when you say the prayer, when you mean it, when you repent, you receive the spirit. Others will say the spirit will come to those who believed, but it might be at the time that the spirit decides. So that's the classical vineyard position that you'll see like in Morpheus book, um, which is a good conversation that we're not going to have, yep. but we are along with case. the baptism and the baby baptism. We're not going to talk about that. Well, right actually now. that's funny. Cause <laughs> like, there's not many vineyard pastors that would say like baby baptism is okay. That's yeah. mostly me saying yeah. that I like the Anglican tradition. I just, I just <laughs> joked because we were having a conversation the other day and stuff about like, well, are you actually filled with the spirit if you're not baptized? Can you actually get into heaven if you're not baptized? But anyways, we're not going to talk about that. Oh, <laughs> we're well, going to leave that alone. Another time, another time. <laughs> be rest assured that you don't. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's uh, if you just got if you've been saved and this is the first time you received Jesus, don't rush and get to a bathtub. Yeah, and, you're you good. Know, but you're good. baptism needs to be a part of your life as though <laughs> it's 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 what follows your confession. Back so. to eschatology. Yeah. <laughs> I hope no one's confused. Uh, I got no, 35 viewers. <laughs> <laughs> they can message us. It's yeah, all for good. Sure, for sure. Um, uh, back to eschatology. Yeah. So the viewpoints from everybody. Okay, so um, the classical Pentecostal. So if you if you're a Pentecostal, or if you're a Baptist, or if you're an Evangelical, or if you're a Charismatic, most likely you have been raised in an environment that dispensationalism is the norm. So so explain you, what that viewpoint looks like for those people. Sure. So if your if your church talks about a rapture. Or talks about Israel a lot, your church is likely dispensationalist. And the reason that it's the case is because there's two major distinctions um, that a dispensationalist church will have that other churches that are non dispensational don't really care about whatsoever. And those distinctions are the, the main characteristic of dispensationalism is that the church and Israel are two very distinct things they're not the same at all so israel it's is its own thing and the church is its other thing and both of them are uh the bride of christ but both of them have different covenants um so that's one distinction the other distinction of dispensationalism is the idea of a pre-tribulational rapture that the church will be taken out of the world prior to uh, Jesus's, uh, prior to the tribulation that the world's going to experience. So you have this twofold return that Jesus comes for his saints, the world endures under seven years of tribulation, and then Jesus returns at the end with his saints to overthrow uh, the Antichrist and his armies. So those are the two major distinctions, um, but there's a lot of things that are embedded into that theology that most people don't know about, and it's the embedded pieces of this theology that really, really um, don't jive with uh, one, it shouldn't jive with a charismatic audience, and two, it doesn't really it doesn't work really well with kingdom theology at all. And our presupposition obviously is that kingdom theology is correct and therefore dispensationalism can't be correct. Now I will caveat one thing um, before we go further into this because there might be uh, 
a dispensationalist will say, well, I've read academic papers and I actually understand the progressive, uh, uh, progressive dispensationalist opinion. And if that's you, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about mostly the, the folk, the folk dispensationalism that's mostly in the church. But I will kind of just make this caveat now. There is a, a movement called progressive dispensationalism that is very, very close to generic evangelicalism with one caveat, and they'll stay with the first presupposition that the church and Israel are separate, but there's always different kind of lines they draw there. And even though I would disagree with this, and I'll explain why I disagree with this, this is not nearly as problematic as the rest of the embedded situations that are kind of the, the rest of the theology that's embedded in dispensationalism. So if you're a progressive dispensationalist and you really like Daryl Bach, I'm not going to fight you. And we're friends for as much as I can tell and <laughs> care. So, yeah, anyway. So what was what was the thing then you were going to caveat against it? Uh, oh, I'm saying that the progressive dispensationalists are so close to my position. Oh, okay. Except for they would put a distinction between the church and Israel. Okay. But because they don't really draw their lines too hard, um, that's our one and only real struggle, unless we're going to get nitty gritty about the millennium. And. Honestly, I don't really want to get into millennial fights in this video. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, so um, was there um, was the okay? So let's take because um, I think we've pretty much covered most of what Pentecostals think or Baptists think, mm -hmm. where we stand. But go to the other side of the pond and maybe even differ like where Catholicism thinks and stuff on like end times and stuff too. Sure. Since we're touching on the different viewpoints, unless you well, stay I mean, away from that. No, it's, it's fine. It, uh, that'd be a good thing. So let me lay that out for yeah. a second. Cause um, if we're talking, <clears throat> if we're talking eschatology as a tradition, uh, dispensationalism has only been around since 1832 ish, right? It's, it's new. It's the new kid on the block. And it's been adopted by Baptists and the people on that same branch, um, mostly because of the fundamentalist movement of the early 1900s. Um, but if you're looking historically, uh, if we go all the way back to the beginning of time, we have um, the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church, they believe in amillennialism. Like their whole thing is that uh, the church age has begun, that Jesus is king, and the kingdom of God is expanding. Now, they're going to have different viewpoints from us because we'll agree with a lot of things, but we're going to disagree with what is the kingdom with the Catholics because the Catholic church believes that they're the kingdom. Yeah. Um, and I'm not <coughs> entirely sure how the Eastern Orthodox appropriates this, but for the majority of Christian history... All millennialism has been the standard since Augustine. Before that, you had historic premillennialism, um, but that kind of died off after Montanus, which was in the mid fourth century. And up until recently, premillennialism really hasn't been a thing. But if, I mean, moving now into modern academics, you have mm -hmm. two major fields of thought you have. Um, millennialism having a big resurgence in academics and you have historic premillennialism as huge places. And then of course you have postmillennialism kind of coming in there and saying, Hey, don't forget me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's taking a huge, like postmillennialism, we'll take a whole video on this. That's taking a huge surge in charismatic system right now. And this, this kind of goes back to our thought for a moment is we remember in the early 1900s when the assemblies in Church of God and the Pentecostals formed, they took on that original idea of, they just took the Baptist eschatology that went counter against the rest of their theology. Postmillennialism and the revivalism with the Charismatics and Pentecostals, they go hand in hand. And so that's why you're seeing this climb in like seven mountain mandate and post-millennialism or at least 
a variation of postmillennialism really rising. And we'll talk about that in full in the next episode. But that's actually the logical conclusion that they should, like, that, that breeds in the mind of the charismatic. And we can break that down. Um, but I haven't really told us why dispensationalism doesn't fit with our kingdom theology. Yeah, um, well, my last question for you for this episode was going to be, um, where are we? Yeah. Where do we stand? And I say we because we're both pastors at the sure. same church and stuff, and you explain it a lot better than I do. But I mean, like, explain where we are, where we stand, and why we don't lean towards that dispensational way. Sure. So in Derek Morphew's uh, book, uh, Breakthrough, he presents the millennial views. I'm not really going to worry too much about millennial views because millennial views are just so focused on Revelation 20. And I've, in a previous video, kind of outed myself as an amillennial. I agree with the historic church in this uh, to a degree. But um, speaking on behalf of like the vineyard, uh, at least um, <coughs> Derek Morphew's suggestion that the vineyard should be pursuing the middle ground, um, I think that the kingdom theology of the already and the not yet, which I probably should break down a little bit, um, the already and not yet uh, is the is the key value of the vineyard. So I need to kind of explain this and explain what dispensationalism is in reference to this and why kingdom theology yeah. can't work. Go for it. So wait, why kingdom theology can't work? Dispensationalism, in its classic form cannot work oh, okay. with already and not yet theology. Okay. The and way you why, phrased it made it sound like you were saying kingdom theology can't work. Sorry. Kingdom I'm, theology okay. I got is you. not compatible with yeah. dispensationalism. Got you. Okay. That's okay. Now the caveat was progressive dispensationalism is a different monster. So if you're just don't write me if you're progressive <laughs> dispensational. No, write him. Write him. That'll be fun. No. <laughs> you and I will go nowhere. <laughs> but don't just like say I'm a progressive dispensationalist just because you don't like to be discategorized either. <laughs> be a lot like think about it. So anyway. <laughs> Continue. The already and the not yet is the bread and butter of kingdom theology. And it's the story that we are telling over and over again through the kingdom story. The already is that Jesus, in his earthly ministry, the whole point of the gospel was that Jesus became king. Um, and I can use that just as a thought, like they co-opted this word called gospel, which was uh, uh, the euangelion is the Greek word, which if we use it, it's the evangelion, but euangelion is how it's really pronounced. The, evangel uh, the evangelion, is the good news and in its base form good news just means good news but it was never used that way um, by the people writing the people that use this word was the emperors and every time an emperor would die they would bring a new emperor and that emperor would send out his evangelion and it was the good news that caesar augustus was on the throne it's the good news that Tiberius Caesar is on the throne. And so the Evangelion was the good news that because we have a Caesar on the throne in Rome, the eschatology of Rome, the uh, overthrow of all the lands is going to continue. Rome is superior and we are going to overcome everything. The gospel writers co-opted this word and said, this is the story, the good news that King Jesus is now ruler of the universe. He is the king of kings. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to him. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all the commandments that he has given. And he will be with us until the end of the age. That is the good news, that Jesus has become king and he's not king in the future, he is king now. Yep. Now the already aspect of this is that the there are elements of the kingdom of God that we experience in the here and now. And what that means is that you and I have a foretaste of the future. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was supposed to come on the last day of human history. That when the Messiah would come, when the end of the world was coming, now everybody would be filled with the Spirit. Well, 
when Jesus took on the last day in his death, Pentecost represents this Jesus in the Spirit coming in the middle of history rather than the end. And so what we are saying is we now have a foretaste of the future. You and I, when we experience the Holy Spirit, we're experiencing the future reality of the kingdom in the present. The future age has impacted and broken through in the present age, which is the already and the not yet. So we're experiencing the future currently with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So when we are saved, we are living in the new age. We are not going to be new creations. We are new creations. We're not just going to be saved from our sin. We are saved. And we're being saved and we will be saved already and not yet. We are, we are being, and we will be fully. And that's why we can experience healings and miracles, signs and wonders, and yet they're not permanent because we don't have immortality. The immortality comes when Jesus' kingdom fully arrives right. and sin is obliterated and overthrown and we are resurrected into our perfect state where there is no sin, there is no death, there is no disease. So the already is we experience the future, but not fully. But when the perfect comes, as Paul says, we will no longer be looking at this like... In a, in a dim shadow. It will no longer like looking into a foggy mirror. We will see him fully. And so in the present, we live with the reality that Jesus is king, but we fully will actualize that at the return of Christ. So how does this not work with dispensationals yes. and their eschatology? So dispensationalists have this idea that Jesus, when he came... Um, he was supposed to bring the kingdom of God in its fullness at his beginning. So when he came, he was supposed to present the kingdom, but he died instead. That his death was plan B. So plan A, get the kingdom, start the kingdom, then everything was going to get revived. But because Israel denied Jesus, he decided to postpone the kingdom. So like that whole section where uh, in, in Acts chapter 1 where Peter's like, well, aren't you going to restore Israel? And he's like, it's not for you right now, but go in my name and do these things. And he goes away. And so what dispensationalists will read into that text is they'll say, okay, well, Jesus didn't bring the kingdom. He talked about the kingdom, but he's not bringing the kingdom. The kingdom's not coming until he returns. And we have that. 1,000 years um, that when Jesus comes, he's going to reign for 1,000 years as we see in Revelation 20. And that's what we call the millennium. And all of the kingdom that Jesus actually wanted to present will happen then. So hmm. what you end up with is you don't have an already. Essentially, Jesus is not king right now in that system. Jesus is just up in heaven awaiting for the kingdom to come so that when he does return, then the kingdom starts. How does the kingdom come then? Well, they, they would say that like the kingdom's not yet come. They'd say we're awaiting the kingdom. They wouldn't use Do they still the... expect him to bring it? Oh, for sure. Oh, okay. But it's the not yet. It's gotcha. truly not yet. Like the way that we would talk about it is like we would say we have already the kingdom, but the not yet of the kingdom is yeah, when he comes. Yeah, I get it. They they're think, expecting yeah. the, uh, they're, they're fully just not yet. Nothing's available. Like... They wouldn't put it the sucks. same categories. It sucks. Like, but that, I think we've talked about this a little bit before because that's like the viewpoint of like, well, Jesus showed up and basically failed, so he's not king yet, so he's going to leave, and then he'll come back later and try again. But this is also the... So reason. if he fails again, like, right. <laughs> then he, what, is he going to leave and then come back and try again later? But like, this is also the reason... Make sense. This is also the reason that it doesn't make any sense for Pentecostals and Charismatics. Yeah. Because if you have no kingdom... You have no healing, yeah. you have no miracles, yeah. you have no signs and wonders. Yeah. And I would say it this way, because dispensationalism leads to cessationism. And let me explain that a little bit too. If you're a dispensationalist, you must believe that there are dispensations, which means there are times and spaces in which God does different things through time and space at different times. Um, so like 
uh, if I take the age of Adam or the age of Noah or the age of Abraham and the age of Moses, the age of David, the age of Jesus and the early apostles, and now we're in the church age, but since the apostles, we have no miracles. The Pentecostals, to be logical, have to add a, uh, a new dispensation we're in since Azusa Street. They now have to, since Topeka, Kansas, I should say, since 1901, there has to be a new dispensation called the last days. And so they agree with the dispensationalists, so they have to agree with the dispensationalists that there was no miracles until 1901, and that's what we call restoration. We're a restorationist movement. And so you have to add a whole new dispensation. It has to now make its own rounds, and that's really where everything breaks down. Right, so initial dispensationalism doesn't work uh, for the charismatic. So you have to add a new dispensation that we're in until when, right? Whereas if you're a kingdom theologian or a, a, an adherent to kingdom theology, I'm not a theologian. I don't have a degree. Sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> if you adhere to kingdom theology, you're saying no dispensations. God has had one story that he's going to accomplish all the way through the story. And that's what our whole podcast is about, is that we are telling the kingdom story that it started in Eden, and it's it, will end Eden, in Eden. Eden. it will eat, uh, end in Eden. Yep. That the whole story is about God fulfilling his plan from the beginning and will end at the fullness of the Gentiles and Israel's f- accepting of the Messiah. And that will complete the Great Commission and the fullness of the story. So... We would disagree with the fundamental thought process of dispensations. God's not doing different stories. God has one story. And so as a kingdom adherent, I can't agree with dispensationalism. Also, as a continuationist, I can't be a restorationist because then I have to say that there are no miracles between the time of the apostles to the time of Azusa Street or Topeka, Kansas. Sorry, Who cares? No one's going to know what I'm saying. (laughs) That means that there's 1,800 years of no miracles. But if I look at history, I see miracles throughout the entire church age. Yeah, Like the Spirit has never What was the book you've been reading recently that documents a whole bunch of miracles? Uh, It's called Miracles by Craig Keener. Yeah. And Craig Keener does a historical document area of like miracles since like 15, 16, 1700s yeah. on to present day. Yeah. So, and they're all, I mean, they're as verified as you can with eyewitnesses and, ev- you know, medical evidence as you can get. Yeah. So. Nice. Okay. So da, 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 where are we at? Okay. I'm going to call this one. Okay. Okay. In the next episode, we're going to talk more on the mountains. Yep. The seven we'll, talk about, we'll talk about reconstructionism right. and that fun And then stuff. the next one um we'll ask a few more questions on like where people are at and stuff with like what their thought processes are <laughs> yeah. and things like that. So we'll we'll do something that's a little fun. fun. We'll do some quick some quick fire ones, okay? Nice. All nice. right, cool. All right, well thank you guys for that one. I hope you enjoyed. Um I'm so sorry I was like coughing nonstop, guys. I apologize. I tried to preface in the beginning I was sick. So I'm feeling hopefully better as we continue to film because we're busting out a few of these to get ahead because I will be traveling again for work. So, uh, yeah, if on the next couple episodes you see me just kind of just walk away, I'll just edit the camera shift only to you. (laughs) So I just walk out. (laughs) Anyways, we love you guys. If you have questions and comments, as always, please leave them. Um, These next few episodes and stuff in the subject is always heavy-handed. It's always... (laughs) uh, What? You stupid people. (laughs) Well, it's also like very like touchy, heavy subject that everybody feels like has an opinion on for what's going to happen in the end and how it's going to look. You oh, know, yeah. and wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of fun stuff. And like the end right. is coming, the end is near, you know, type fun stuff. So, um, but anyways, if you guys have questions or comments, leave them. We love to see them. We'll get to them. We'll address them. We'll bring them on an episode. We'll talk about them and stuff and answer any questions that come about. But otherwise, we love you guys. Thank you for tuning in again. Hope you enjoyed this one. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the The Kingdom Kingdom Story Story Podcast. Podcast. Not Kingdom Beards.